take a different shape, Professor Sabroy. Professor Shishi Roy was suggesting that we could reconstitute it. Professor Sabroy, are you listening to me? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Ma'am, shall we? Yeah. A very good evening to you all. On behalf of the International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, I would like to welcome you all to the international lecture series on teacher, text, and tradition, Indian philosophical heritage. The chair of today's session is Professor Dilip Kumar Mohanta, former vice chancellor of University of Kalyani and former vice chancellor of the Sanskrit University, Kolkata. And we are fortunate to have with us today, Professor Graham Priest, Professor of Philosophy at the Graduate Center of City University of New York, who will speak to us on para-consistent logic and Madhyamika. I would like to welcome Professor Shrikala M. Nair, Director, International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, to introduce the speaker as well as the theme. Thank you, Ramya. Let me start with the invocation. Kalyana. Gunagatraya Kamida Bhalal Dhaini Shreema Venkatanadhaya Shreenivaya Tenama Good evening to all. Friends, I'm happy to welcome you all uh, to the uh, International Lecture Series organized by International School for Sri Shankaracharya uh, Studies. Through this lecture program, we aim to tap the international resources on Indian philosophy. And very often, these scholars make attempts to juxtapose insights of Indian philosophers to their uh, Western uh, counterparts. This, we, this evening, we have an eminent professor in philosophy, uh, Professor Graham Priest, who is one of the leading proponents of uh, paraconsistent logic, as most of you might know. His uh, academic credentials are probably familiar to this enlightened uh, audience. What uh, actually led me to invite him to our forum is that um, he is a friend of India and Indian philosophies and has uh, delivered several lectures, I think, before the break of uh, the COVID. Uh, some two years back, um, we were together in Calcutta and later in uh, Nalanda dialogue as well. And I am aware that uh, he has uh, delivered a series of lectures in Calcutta University, if I'm right, on both uh, uh, Jaina and Buddhist logic. Uh, and uh, he also uh, came to uh, Nalanda uh, dialogue uh, to deliver uh, lectures, though I could not listen to his lecture. Uh, so uh, I don't have to introduce the speaker as those who are working in logic and generally in philosophy. He is uh, very, very familiar to the uh, international uh, figure. And we are indeed happy to have uh, Professor Priest with us on behalf of uh, the school, I warmly welcome Professor Graham Priest to this online platform. In uh, today, we have an eminent Buddhist logician with us, uh, Professor Dilip Kumar Mahanta, who has done extensive research in Madhyamaka uh, School of uh, Buddhist. I've, uh, we were together in several uh, uh, platforms, and in fact, in some sense, we are colleagues. Uh, since uh, both of us are office bearers uh, for uh, IPC Indian Philosophical Congress. 
so I have known him very closely, his uh, philosophical contribution, heard him several uh, times. And uh, I couldn't think of a better person to chair uh, the session. When Nagarjuna has been spoken, I thought Dilip Ji should be with us uh, so that he could add to whatever uh, that has been said uh, uh, today, uh, remembering the great contributions of one of the best philosophical minds that the globe has produced, namely Nagarjuna. <clears throat> so I, on behalf of uh, uh, International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, I very warmly welcome Dilip Kumar Mohanta, who has been uh, Vice Chancellor twice. <laughs> Uh, to both uh, to both uh, Kalyani, Kalyani University, I think the voice is resounding. Please, can you all mute your mic? To both Kalyani University as well as uh, the Sanskrit University, the very first vice chancellor for the Sanskrit University in uh, Kolkata. So as a Sanskrit scholar and also a scholar in uh, Buddhist uh, logic, uh, Professor Mohanta is the right person uh, to be uh, in the chair today. Uh, so very, very warm welcome to Professor Dilip Kumar uh, Mohanta. Friends. Namaskar. Thank you, Namaskar. Madam. Namaskar. <laughs> Namaskar. Uh, this uh, evening, we are going to take up a very important uh, topic for discussion that, in fact, enrolls almost all sub-disciplines of philosophy within its fold, namely logic, metaphysics, ethics, and even religion. In a while, I'll, I'm, go I'm going to tell you how. Logical pluralism, uh, you know that we are going to speak about paraconsistent logic. But before we get to paraconsistent logic, a bit on uh, logical pluralism is uh, uh, probably a, a, a preliminary uh, topic to be discussed prior, prior to getting onto paraconsistent logic. So, what's logical pluralism? It's a theory that has reasonably uh, good acceptance and market today, both in academic forums as well as in the field of technology. This is a position which formally holds that logic can take many forms, or that there could be more than one correct logic. Till very recently, we never could even conceive that there could be more than one logic. And today, we happily accept it. And as I have said, uh, that uh, primarily it means, or one version of it says that while logics L1 and L2 can disagree about which arguments are valid, but nevertheless, both can be getting things right. This is the simplest definition. Uh, of logical pluralism and uh, there is as i have said increasing popularity to this view since most of the uh, streams of science come forward or compete with one another to subscribe to uh, logical pluralism be it the physical sciences chemical sciences the biosciences or even the latest uh, mm, the new science of bioinformatics all of them seem to compete with one another in subscribing to uh, logical uh, pluralism Theory. The theory, however, draws its major input from intuitionism, one of the schools, a popular school of uh, mathematics. And also, we all have heard a lot about logical pluralism through anti-realism, again, uh, which has been popularized by Michael Dermott. Uh, since the uh, second part of the bygone uh, century, however, Interest in contemporary debate on the matter has also led some scholars, at least, to look for its or revisit some of the ancient thoughts, particularly those that are born uh, from or those that have had non-Western origin. And what I have in mind is definitely Indian, particularly an early lease of it can be found in uh, Buddhism. Uh, and among the streams of Buddhism, of course, the Madhyamaka school of thought that has originated way back in second century AD has had an in-depth insight on this particular stream of thought. And it would be, it would be a surprise for the scholarly community 
today to know that logical pluralism was taken to a considerable depth by the school that survived for more than eight centuries in this uh, uh, land. <clears throat> and we know the rivalry between the Nyaya school and the Madhyamaka school. The Nyaya school subscribing to the binary logic and the Madhyamakas uh, consistently arguing against uh, uh, the uh, Nyayagas. And to that extent, uh, the Nyayagas have negatively contributed to the uh, development of logical pluralism. And admittedly, a lot of thought went in this direction in India, way back in the uh, early Christian era, and uh, most of which can I believe, well, uh, Professor Priest is the final word, but most of which can be juxtaposed with its modern Western counterparts. However, now what has struck me with regard to this, uh, uh, this consistent uh, denial of binary with Madhyamaka is something like this, which I'm going to tell you. I, I believe that uh, this innovative invention which Nagarjuna has uh, made was not aimed at any theoretical speculation. He was not at all interested in the theoretical speculations, nor was it meant for a self-rejoice, a kind of an armchair uh, philosophy by indulging in theoretical abstractions. On the contrary, to my mind, and I presume that those who are familiar with Indian way of philosophizing would agree with me. On the contrary, it was meant to take the world ahead to the path of Nibbana or Nirvana, the path of redemption, where the individual gets rid of the earthly sufferings. So this religious goal, which is being attached through this innovative logical thinking has brought in all novelty and originality to this idea. So here you see a consistent journey from logic through ontology to religious. And this is what makes Nagarjuna's contributions unique. In Mula Karika, Nagarjuna points out, that the non-dual absolute, which is Shunya, appears diverse only on account of illusion. And as you all know, the phenomenal world, according to him, arises for the experience dependently. And that which has arisen dependently, that which is uh, that which has arisen dependently on this or that has not arisen substantially. That is Swabhava Shunya in the very first. Uh, uh, shloka, I think that is in the uh, the very first Dhyana Shloka, where he says the third, the fourth pada, uh, third pada. Yep, yep, pratitya samatpan, yep, pratitya samatpadam, prapancho upashamam, shivam, deshayama sa sambuddham vande, vandada, vande vadatam varam. Yep, pratitya samatpadam, prapancho upashamam, shivam, deshayama sa so this uh, led him that on one side the Swabhava Shunyatva of the reality and on the other side the dependent, uh, the Pratitya uh, Samutpanatva of uh, the reality would have led him to propose a two-tier system of reality as you all know the conventional and the absolute and where in the former in the conventional you speak of the Pluralist, pluralistic world where the law of causation and the law of uh, the laws of logic are functional and on the other the absolute these laws neither the law of causation nor the law of laws of logic are uh, functional this is the two tired system that has been proposed uh, by Nagarjuna now we also know that in order to define the nature of this absolute reality he speaks about it and what is Chatushkoti? Chatushkoti you know, speaks about the four the corners where it says either it holds or it does not hold or it both holds and does not hold or it neither holds nor does it not hold, declining the four possibilities, the four logical uh, possibilities. And this Chatushkoti brings along with it some implications in logic, which I'm sure uh, Professor Priest will tell you much uh, better. The primary implication is that the principle of double negation has been 
uh, rejected for it would not for if we would not drop uh, double negation then the court is three and the four uh, would collapse since by de Morgan's law they are equal and further it also contradicts both the law of excluded middle and the law of non-contradiction because they are of course they are interconnected in contemporary world a logical system in which the principle of exclusion is denied is called paraconsistent and one in which lem that is uh, mm, uh, the exclu uh, excluded middle has been dropped is called paraconsistent and uh, professor priest uh, would take you to that interesting what interests me is in fact the way the the uh, the method by which he he accomplishes this he, his formulation of Chatushkoti also revises the classical concept of negation. Professor Pahi, very interestingly, says that how the logic gets revised by revising the rules of grammar. And that is a unique contribution of India, wherein he proposes two notions of negation, a discussion on two types of negation, I'm sure. Uh, Dilip Ji would speak about that. The Paryudasa and the uh, Prasajya, one speaks about the nominally bound negative and the other verbally bound negative. The implications of proposing this two tier definition of negation is increasingly significant at both levels, both at the Vyakarana, the grammar level, as well as at the level of logic. And um, I remember late Professor Parkey, who has significantly contributed in this in these lines so by adopting prasadhyaya prasad pratishedha madhyamaka the chief what they wanted that is to negate a proposition without accepting its consequences now what makes this intricate logical epistemic theory of madhyamaka's unique is that its string its strings are extended to realms that transcend the world of logic as i have said it has its strings extended to ontology and to religion that is what makes it uh, interesting for nagarjuna so this the serious exercise in logic is only a prelude to great metaphysical claims his great metaphysical monism an ontological position that implicates the need to embrace a religious path the magga as it is called the marga in sanskrit that radiates one from the eternal sorrow as you know, falling in line with the rest of the Indian philosophers, Nagarjan also believed that it is not sufficient to discover the nature of reality. What is needed is that one need to assimilate the implications of, of this discovery and practice it. So this pragmatic orientation of the thought is what has been significant and what has been vivid in his uh, theories. If you read the later part of the Mula Madhyamakarika, all these practical implications are very, very vivid. Our realization that the absolute is Swabhava Shunya, how would it reflect in our behavior? We would become, and see the two realizations that the reality is Swabhava Shunya and the nature of uh, what has been experienced as Pratitya Samutpanna Swa. All this, 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 this realization would fill in us an irresistible compassion to all beings. A compassion that radically transforms our existence. The intellectual analysis thus culminates in a new way of looking at things and behaving and realizing the innermost existence of oneself. And so therefore, if Dilip Ji remembers, as I have said it in IPC, the, um, the four principles, Maitri, Karna, Mududha and Upeksha, which uh, all Buddhas, uh, including Nagarjuna, they speak about, is they are not ethical principles. They are in free, indeed reflections of the basic ontological principles that Buddhists do contribute. Well, friends, our uh, concerns are uh, not uh, much on metaphysics and uh, religion, I'm sure. But um, in a, a brief uh, informal conversation, um, I do not know whether Professor Priest remember, I did ask him about Indian philosophy and then I asked him, do you think that uh, Indian uh, logic is rooted in ontology? Uh, I mean, that's a fact. And then do you think that it is a kind of a shortcoming? And then he said that, well, all logics are rooted in ontologies. And that is uh, really impressed me, which is, which is a plain fact, as all of us know. 
So this is how I see Nagarjuna. And this is what I believe as the original contribution of Nagarjuna. He's traveled from logic through ontology to religion as something unique in the whole world of philosophy, uh, as I see it. And uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, we have two eminent uh, scholars here who could uh, speak at length about this uh, wonderful topic, uh, which is both philosophical and in this land, philosophy is not armchair philosophy. This is meant for praxis. And Professor Davi is also here. Welcome, Professor Davi. He would know that um, uh, the nature of Indian philosophy is has this unique factor of uh, prayojana vichara. What is the what is the use of exercising uh, or uh, conceptualizing? And with this uh, few words, uh, I have uh, great pleasure in inviting the scholarly community to this uh, uh, platform. And uh, I really look forward for a very fruitful uh, dis discussion and uh, exchange of ideas, which is the primary goal of such lecture series. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for beautifully uh, setting the stage for today's program. Uh, now I'm pleased to invite Professor Dilip Kumar Mohenta, the chair of today's session, to speak a few words. Uh, thank you so much. Good, good evening to all my friends. I'm especially thankful to the organization and its director, Professor Sikola Nair, my old friend, to give a rare chance uh, to refresh my old friendship. It's more important in academic world. Uh, we, we put the bottom for refreshing computer, but it is also important here to refresh our mind, our friendship. Friendship is a great virtue I consider and emphasized in Indian tradition as well as in Greek traditions. And sometimes we debate our, among ourselves, we disagree. Philosophers agree to disagree. This is a healthy sign of philosophers. They seldom differ. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I uh, appreciate and uh, the, the effort taken by the center for such a discourse where we can listen to the experts. Uh, Professor Graham Priest, we have a very close relation we consider, especially the Calcutta University people. <clears throat> Uh, first, uh, when he visit, I think in nineteen, in two thousand six or seven January, I can't remember. Uh, we had an international seminar under my directorship, and he was there in Calcutta University. And later on, to just before this pandemic, he was here for a series of lectures. So uh, he is very close to the heart of philosophy academia in Calcutta. And we meet in Nalanda. Uh, we really, what I remember, what is the most prominent contribution of ancient India to the culture of the world? It is certainly in the field of philosophy. And if today we are to philosophize, then what way? Unless we relate our tradition to address the problem we face today, then it would be a only repetition of orthodoxy, not a living tradition. One way of doing this is to confront Eastern thought and Western thought with one another and attempt, if possible, a synthesis or a reasoned rejection of either, yes, emphasized by Casey Bhattacharya. If that were possible, how only geniuses can unveil 
the soul of India through philosophy that we can method methodically attempt to discover it. And Professor Graham preached is, is one among such genius. We is trying to unveil Indian tradition, especially the Buddhists and the Jaina logic to relate it to the model necessity of the practical world today. Friends, we all know no idea of one cultural language can exactly be translated in another cultural language. Every culture has its distinctive physiology, which is reflected in each vital idea an idol presented by that particular culture. But in spite of that, we can't stop here. We must try to see the common shareable grounds in both the histories. Professor Graham Priest is one of the father figure in logic, especially as rightly said by Professor Srikala Nayar, in paraconsistent logic. And we all are waiting to listen to him. So without taking much time, it's my great pleasure to invite Professor Priest to present his paper. Professor Priest. Please. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the very kind introduction uh, by Srikala and Dilip Kumar. Uh, it's very kind of you. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as uh, Sri Kala mentioned, the, the last country I visited before the pandemic was India. And uh, I'm delighted to be back, if only virtually. Hopefully, uh, down the track, it will be in person. But um, we make the best of the circumstances at present. And uh, I, I agree entirely with um, Dilip Kumar that we're at the dawn of a new era, era of philosophy when it's going to be truly global. Um, there are so many great traditions in philosophy and they all have something very valuable in. And uh, we're now starting to be in a position where we can understand the insights of all these traditions and hopefully something new and important will come out of these what that will be only time will tell but uh first we we must learn to understand each other properly and today is a small part of that exercise so um let me see if i can share my screen Um, okay, so um, you you ought to be able to see my screen. Uh, is, is that true? I see. We are seeing it. Good. Okay. The the problem about sharing a screen is you can't see the audience at all. So um, you'll have to. Tell me if there's something wrong. Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, when Sri Kala wrote to me, uh, she said, please, can you talk about paraconsistent logica majamica? That's an interesting conjunction. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, um, I don't think I have to tell anybody in this audience what majamica is. We'll look at some of the more concrete details later on. But um, I may have to tell people about what power consistency is because I'm aware that many people in this audience will not be logicians. So let me start by briefly saying what power consistency is. So there's a principle of inference, uh, which is nowadays, nowadays called explosion. 
And what it says is that if you've got a contradiction, then everything follows. So this sign here is the logician of sign for negation. This sign here is the logician of sign for entails. So what this says is that if you have the information that A and not A, then you can infer B. And that's true for any A and B you like. Now, um, prima facie, this doesn't look like a very plausible principle of inference. So just consider the following inferences. Donald Trump is corrupt. Donald Trump is not corrupt. So the Earth has two moons. Or this one, Delhi is in India. Delhi is not in India, so water contains hydrogen. Now, those don't look very plausible inferences because Donald Trump, corrupt or otherwise, seems to have nothing to do with the satellites of the moon. And similarly, the location of India seems to have nothing to do with the molecular constitution of water. So those don't look very plausible inferences. However, uh, it may come as a surprise to people who have never studied contemporary logic that the principle of explosion is taken to be valid. Uh, why? I'll explain in due course. But um, in the last 50 years, we have seen developments of one kind of uh, logic called paraconsistent logic according to which explosion is not valid. So here's the definition of paraconsistency. A logic is paraconsistent if, according to it, explosion is not valid. Okay, so that's the modern paraconsistent logic. And what I'm going to do in, in the rest of today's talk is explain some connections between Madhyamaka philosophy and paraconsistent logics. Of course, the philosophers that we'll be looking at had no knowledge of contemporary techniques of logic any more than philosophers in the West at the same time. So I'm not going to tell you that um, Madhyamaka philosophers um, had the modern conception of a paraconsistent logic that will be completely anachronistic. But what we will see is that in their thinking, their picture of inference or metaphysics, uh, these are closely connected, laid the basis of some contemporary paraconsistent logics. So that's where we're going. So that was the introduction. You've just had that. Now, uh, the talk will now have two main parts. Um, in the second part, I'm going to talk about Nagarjuna. But you can't start the story there, because the thought of Nagarjuna uh, comes off of some prior developments. So before we get to Nagarjuna and Madhyamaka, I'll need to talk about uh, some earlier Buddhist philosophy. Uh, and in particular, the principle of the Chaturkoti. And what we'll see is how the Chaturkoti lays the ground for a contemporary paraconsistent logic called first degree entailment. When we've done that, we will then move on to Madhyamaka and talk about Nagarjuna and what he turned this picture into, what he developed out of this. So this is where we're going. And I'm well aware that many people in the audience are not logicians, so I will try to take the, the logic uh, fairly slowly and carefully. Um, all right, so let, let, let's talk about the Chaturkoti and uh, Four Corners. So this is um, a part of um, a sutra from the Mijima Nikaya where uh, the Buddha, Gautama, is talking to an interlocutor, Vata. Um, and Vata is interested in what happens to an enlightened person after they die. We know what happens before they die because we have the Buddha as an example. But what happens after they die? 
And this is how the dialogue goes. How is it Gautama? Does Gautama believe that a Tathagata, that is an enlightened person, exists after death? And that this view alone is true and every other is false? Nay, Vacha, I do not hold that the Tathagata exists after death and that this view alone is true and every other is false. How is it Gautama? Does Gautama believe that a Tathagata does not exist after death and that this view alone is true and every other is false? Nay, Vacha, I don't hold that a Tathagata does not exist after death and that this view alone is true and every other is false. Now, if, if you'd been a few miles to the West Ancient Greece at the time, that is where the dialogue would have stopped because there are only two possibilities, true and false. However, the dialogue goes on. How is it, Gautama? Does Gautama believe that a Tathaga both exists and doesn't exist after death? That that view alone is true and every other is false? Nay, Vacha, I do not hold that a Tathagata both exists and doesn't exist after death, and that this view alone is true and every other is false. How is it, Gautama? Does Gautama believe that a Tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist after death, and that this view alone is true and every other is false? Nay, Vacha, I do not hold that a Tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist after death, and that this view alone is true and every other is false. Now, that fourfold is the Chaturjkoti. So, what Vacha is saying is, um, okay, the Tathagata exists. Is that true, false, both or neither? Those are the four points of the Chaturjkoti. True, false, both or neither. Now, notice that... The Buddha refuses to endorse any of those four. Let's come, we'll come back to that in the second part of the talk. But uh, for the moment, just notice that both Vacha and Gautama assume this trope of the Katrishkoti, that things can be true, false, both or neither. So Gautama doesn't say to Vacha, Vacha, don't be silly, things can't be both true and false. Don't be silly, Vacha. Things can't be neither true nor false. All these four possibilities are on the table. That's the Chatras Koti. Okay. So what we're now going to see is that the Chatras Koti can be made into the basis of um, a paraconsistent logic. So before we do that, let me just talk briefly about classical logic, that is the logic invented by Frege and Russell around the turn of the 20th century. Um, because if you haven't done much logic before, even this may be new to you. So let's talk a little bit about classical logic. So in classical logic, statements have two possible values, T, and you can think of that as true, F, you can think of that as false. And we're going to write them like this. Um, why I put the arrow going up will be clear in due course, but just for the moment, look at it like that. So in classical logic, you know what the truth values are, T and F. The next thing you need to know is how complex sentences obtain their truth value from simpler sentences. So this is what logicians call truth conditions. Sometimes you'll see this in the form of a diagram called a truth table. But um, what the truth tables will tell you essentially is as follows. So have a look at this sign here. That's the way that logicians write and. So it says, this says that A and B is true just if, well, what would you expect? A is true and B is true. When is A and B false? Well, it's false if A is false or B is false. 
So a conjunction and is false if one or other conjunct is false. So in other words, if A has the value T and B has the value T, A and B is T. So you can join two things with your T, you get a T. And if A is T and B is F, then um, one of them is F. Uh, and it's not the case that both are T, so the conjunction is F. And what you can see here is that the value of A and B is the least of the values of A and B. So you go down the arrows, right? So the value of a conjunction is the least of the values of the conjuncts. That's conjunction. What about disjunction or, well, that's the same, except that instead of going down arrows, you go up arrows. So the value of A or B is the greatest of the values of A and B. So that's conjunction and, and disjunction. Or the other main connective that, or one of the other main connectives that interests logicians is negation. The truth conditions on negation are as follows, that not A is true if A is false, and not A is false if A is true. So you can see that if A is true, not A is false, and if A is false, not A is true. So negation just takes you from T to F and back. All right. So now you know the values, T and F. You know how to compute the values of more complex sentences from their simpler parts. And the last thing you need to know is what it is for an inference to be valid. So it's actually easier to say what an invalid inference is. So an invalid inference is one where the premises are true and the conclusion is not. So the thing about an invalid inference is that it can take you from true premises to conclusion that isn't true. In other words, an inference is valid if it's not invalid, and that is whenever the premises are T, so is the conclusion. Now, I promise to tell you why explosion is taken to be valid in contemporary logic. So there's our friend explosion. Um, notice that an inference is invalid if it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion not to be true. Well, look, here are the premises, and it's impossible for them both to be true. If one is true, the other isn't. Since it's impossible for the premises to be true, it's certainly impossible for the premises to be true and for the conclusion not to be true. So the inference is valid. It cannot take you from true premises to a conclusion that it's not true just because the premises can't be true. So, in other words, that's why explosion is valid in classical logic. Logicians will say sometimes that it's vacuously valid simply because the premises can't be true. So what you see is that classical logic is not paraconsistent because it validates explosion. All right. Now, I'm actually going to pause here for a moment because I don't know how many people in the audience I've left behind. If you haven't seen any modern form of logic before, what I've done may be rather strange. So let me just stop for a minute and see if anyone has any questions about what I've just said, because we're going to build on that. So if you haven't got this, you're going to have difficulty following what comes next. So are there any questions of clarification before we move on? Uh, Shrikala, can you, can you tell me if people have questions, please, because I can't see. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, uh, see, did you hear Professor, please? What he's asking is that if you have any question, questions on what he has so far, please ask him so that let's clarify things and then move ahead. Are there any questions? Please, let's be quick. Are there any questions? So yes. yes. Yeah, please. Please go ahead. Uh, could you please explain once more uh, 
uh, what do you mean by para consistent right <laughs> so uh, this yeah. inference is called explosion right and it tells you that if you've got premises which are a contradiction everything follows so the example i gave earlier was this donald trump is corrupt and donald trump is not corrupt so um the earth has one moon that's an instance of explosion and you can see that apparently the premises don't seem to have much to do with the conclusion but um nonetheless in contemporary logic that inference is taken to be valid um now a paraconsistent logic is exactly one where explosion is not valid is that okay is it okay nirmala uh, actually uh, yeah go ahead uh, what do you what do you exactly mean by contemporary oh. logic hello what do i mean by contemporary, contemporary I mean logic by contemporary? Uh, i mean what do, what do you okay. mean by contemporary logic okay so um if you uh, do a first course in logic uh and certainly in uh the western world but also i'm pretty sure in in india too you will be taught a theory of logic uh that is the logic that was invented by the german philosopher gottlob frege and the british logician bertrand russell around the turn of the 20th century it's called classical logic and that is the logic which you will learn in logic 100 when you when you enroll in a logic course um and it's pretty much the orthodox logic of our day so if you do a course in computer science or in mathematics or in philosophy this is the sort of standard logic that you will be taught may i ask yeah please go ahead uh, how para consistent logic is different from dialectics okay good uh, interesting the word dialectics means many things um but uh okay this is not time to give you a lecture on dialectics but um certainly some dialecticians most notably hegel held that some no. contradictions were true um that's contested by a number of scholars of hegel but i think this is the case so um hegel thought that some contradictions were true if you think that some contradictions are true and you think that explosion is valid you're in trouble because you've got to think that everything is true and that seems crazy so uh it would seem that hegel himself must have endorsed some kind of paraconsistent logic um but of course there's a lot more to dialectics than um validity of inference in dialectics contradiction plays a dynamic role um and um that's a whole new different story so dialectics at least of the hegelian kind certainly involves paraconsistency in some sense um but it involves a lot more than that is is, is that okay yeah thank you thank you i have one more question can i uh wait a minute uh, professor davi uh, i mean biju has one more question yes i have one more please be quick yeah go yeah. okay. ahead okay whether para consistent logic is formal logic or material logic sorry formal or what material is it formal material. logic or material logic it's it ah uh, look there are many paraconsistent logics um but the ones that we're going to be dealing with today are all formal as you, as you'll see in a minute yeah you'll see that thank you thank professor dabey professor dabey uh, uh, can you hear me yeah i can yeah, sure. uh, well, uh, i would like to know what is semantic paradoxes or russell's paradox with reference to the paraconsistent logic Uh, i'm i'm sorry can can you repeat that i didn't get the beginning of it uh, what is uh, uh, you know 
सेमेंटिक पैराडॉक्सिस सीमेंटिक पैराडॉक्सिस और रसेस पैराडॉक्स Okay. Um, look, the semantic paradoxes are things like the liar paradox, and some people, such as myself, take them to be true contradictions. Um, if you hold that view, then you cannot believe that explosion is valid. Otherwise, you think that everything is true. Uh, if we talk more about semantic paradoxes, we're going to go off uh, in a whole new direction. So can we hold the rest of this question till after we've finished with Madhyamaka? Yeah. He will attend the question once he attends to Madhyamaka. Is that fine, Professor Dave? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we can move ahead, Professor Priest, since we don't have okay. any other questions. So, so far we've talked about classical logic. And now let's talk about first uh, a logic called first degree entailment. Don't worry about the name. It's a it's not relevant to today. It's just called FDE. Okay. So in first degree entailment, there are not just two truth values, there are four. Namely true, false, both, and neither. And of course, those are the four values of the Chatrashkoti. So um, you can even draw a diagram. There it is. Um, I'll explain what the diagram means in a minute. But you can see that the four corners of the Chatrashkoti literally appear before your eyes. Okay. So how does first degree entailment work? Well, there are four truth values. The next thing you do need to do is explain how the values of things like conjunction, disjunction, negation work in this new context. So let's have a look at that. So this is how conjunction works. We saw that A and B is true if A is true and B is true and it's false if A is false or B is false. So let's suppose that A is T, it's up here. And let's suppose that B is B, that is both true and false. So one is here, one is here. Then A and B, well, both A and B are true. One's true only and the other's true and false, but both are true. So A and B is true, but B is also false because it's true and false. So the conjunction is B, all right? Because both capital A and capital B are true and one of them is false as well. So we've gone down the arrows. Let's try another example. If A is B and B is N, then A and B is false. Now that's more surprising, but suppose A is here and B is here. Is it the case that both are true? No, um, because this one isn't true. Is it the case that one of them is false? Yeah, this one, because it's both true and false. So um, the conjunction is false here. Now, what you see is that the value of A and B is what mathematicians call the greatest lower bound of the values of A and B. That is, you go down the arrows, but when you go down the arrows, you might get to something which is lower than both of them. So uh, if we've got B and N, you can't simply take the lesser of the two because it's not the case that one is lesser than the other, but you go down arrows until you get the greatest thing, which is less than both of them. Okay. So the value of the conjunction is the greatest lower bound of the values of A and B. And for disjunction, you just do the opposite. You go up arrows. Okay. So the value of a disjunction is the least upper bound of the values of A and B. So again, conjunction, you go down, disjunction, you go up. Okay, what about negation? Well, here are the truth values, the truth conditions of negation. Not A is true if A is false, and not A is false if A is true. Well, so what does that tell us? Well, if A is T, so it's true and not false, then 
its negation is false but not true down here. And if A is false but not true, its negation is true but not false, so it takes us back. So again, negation takes us between T and F. And you might think that negation would take us between B and N, but it doesn't. Because if A is B, if A is both true and false, then its negation is both false and true. And that's the same. The order doesn't matter. So in other words, the negation of B is a B. And similarly, if you think about it, the negation of an N is an N. So both B and N are what mathematicians call fixed points of negation. If you apply negation to a B, you stay there. Same for N. And the last thing you need to know is the definition of validity. And it's essentially the same as before. An inference is valid if whenever the premises are true, that is T or B. So T is true and true only, B is both true and false. So they're both species of truth, right? An inference is valid if whenever the premises are true, that is T or B, so is the conclusion. And now you can see why explosion is not valid. Because let's make, let's give A the value little b, both, then its negation also has the, the value little b, both. But you can give capital B the value f. So A and not A are both true, okay? They're false as well, but they're at least true, and B is not. So what we've seen is that first degree entailment is paraconsistent. So what we've just seen is how one modern formal logic is constructed on the conceptual basis of the Chattrashkoti. Now, the logicians who invented first degree entailment knew nothing of Indian philosophy as far as I know. So they weren't motivated by it. They had other reasons. However, uh, it remains the case that the Chattrashkoti provides the underlying conceptual basis or one of the possible underlying conceptual bases of first degree entailment. Okay, now if you don't know any logic, just close your eyes for a moment. But if you want a proof system for first degree entailment, this is it. So this is a system of rules of proof for classical logic. You get, I, now I've chosen it carefully because to get a, a system of proof for first degree entailment, you drop the red rules. So this one is knocked out by having the value N, neither true nor false. This one is knocked out by having that value little b, so this is explosion. And as I pointed out, that just goes. Um, with, with, with respect to what Srikala said at the beginning, the rule of double negation is valid, okay? It's the rule of explosion and this guy, excluded middle, which are not valid. Okay, so that's the end of the first part of the talk. Um, again, I think I'm going to pause there to see if people have any questions. Um, you'll be glad to hear that for the most part, the hard technical part of this talk is over. Not all of it, but most of it. So let me just pause and see if people have any questions about technical matters they'd like me to go over. Are there questions? What is, can I ask a question on Sandosh? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. What is the purpose and application of paraconsistent logic? It has many. Um, one is in dialectics, which someone mentioned. Um, a very practical one is in uh, computer systems, which not only store information, but infer from it. Because it, uh, information can be corrupt. So you may end up with inconsistent information and you don't want it to explode in your face. Um, another 
concerns the paradox of self-reference, which someone mentioned, so that there are many possible applications. Um, and again, I, I'd happy to be happy to talk about those, but that would take us way off topic for today. Yeah, please see clarifications if you have any, so that he can move uh, further to the next section. Are there any further questions? I suppose not, Professor Priest, you can go ahead. Okay, so that that that's uh, the the Chaturishkoti is pre Madhyamaka. Okay, it goes back to the Buddha himself, fifth or sixth century BCE. Um, let's now move to Nagarjuna, and of course, I'm sure you'll know who he was, um, to the extent that any of us do, which is not a lot. Um, and let's go back to that dialogue between the Buddha and Vajra because it continues as follows. And I remember I pointed out to you that the Buddha refuses to endorse all the four corners of the Chaturishkoti. And Vacha says to the Buddha, well, how can that be? What's going on here, Buddha? Um, and then the Buddha says, but Vacha, if the fire in front of you were to become extinct, would you be aware that the fire in front of you had become extinct? Gautama, if the fire in front of me were to become extinct, I would be aware that the fire in front of me had become extinct. But Vaka, if someone were to ask you in which direction has the fire gone, east or west or north or south, what would you say, O Vaka? The question would not fit the case, Gautama, for the fire which depended on fuel of grass and wood, when all that fuel has gone, and it can get no other, being thus without nutriment, is said to be extinct. So, um, it doesn't fit the case. That's what the Buddha says. What does he mean by doesn't fit the case? Well, the dialogue doesn't go much further than that. But it's a good question. Um, and that question lies um, unanswered in Buddhist philosophy for the next 700 years. So it's kind of a dormant question. What does it mean that none of the four fits the case? Okay, so now we come to Nagarjuna. So this is what one of the questions, it's just one of the questions that Nagarjuna takes up in the Mulamajanka Karaka. Um, so I'm going to abbreviate this as MMK. And Nagarjuna says this, having passed into Nirvana, the victorious conqueror, that's the Buddha, is neither said to be existent, nor said to be non-existent, neither both nor neither are said. Okay, so here's Nagarjuna just repeating what Siddhartha has said. But he goes on to say a bit more about it. Empty, shunya, should not be asserted. Non-empty should not be asserted. Neither both nor neither should be asserted. They are used only nominally. How can the tetra, tetralemma is the Greek translation of Chatter's Koti. How can the tetralemma of permanent and impermanent, etc., be true of the peaceful, that is the Tathagata, how can the tetralemma of finite, infinite, etc., be true of the peaceful? Okay, so the key here is this. These words are used only nominally. So Nagarjuna's explanation is that you can't apply these words to the Tathagata after death because they're only used nominally. All right, so what's going on here? Well, this takes us into deep water. So, it's standard in all Buddhist philosophy that there are two truths, two realities. The Sanskrit, as you know, I'm sure is satya. Sometimes it's best translated as truth. Sometimes it's best translated as reality. Um, but there are two of them. Here's the MMK again. The Buddha's teaching of the Dharma is based on two truths. A truth of worldly convention and an ultimate truth. 
those who don't understand the distinction between the two truths don't understand the Buddha's profound truth. Now, how to understand the distinction between conventional truth and ultimate truth is a tricky question. And it must be said that different schools of Buddhist philosophy disagree about this. Nagarjuna's understanding of the matter is really quite different from the tradition that came before him, the Abhidharma tradition. But one natural way of understanding Nagarjuna's take on the distinction is this. Conventional truth is the phenomenological world of which we're familiar. Okay. So it's the world we kind of experience and appreciate. Um, that world, uh, the objects of that world depend on many things. They depend on the things depend on their parts and they depend on cause and effect and they depend on our concepts. So standard example, a chariot is made of parts and we think of it as a single thing because we apply the concept chariot to it. So that's the conventional world. What about the ultimate world, the ultimate reality, the ultimate truth? Well, that's sort of what's beyond that. Um, so it's what things are like from their own side, as is sometimes said. And what is that like? Well, you can't say, because to say you'd have to apply concepts. But if you apply concepts, what you're doing is constructing conventional reality. In other words, you can't describe ultimate reality. It's ineffable. OK, so um, what is the fifth possibility we're talking about here? It's ineffability. So when Nagarjuna says, "What you, you can't apply existence, not existence, both or neither to a Tathagata after death. What he's saying is the status of the Tathagata is ineffable. And a couple of lines after the lines I quoted, Nagarjuna goes on to say, and exactly the same is true of ultimate reality. So... The status of the Tathagata after death is the same as ultimate reality, namely ineffable. Now, um, if it's ineffable, you can't say anything about it. Um, Nagarjuna is quite well aware of that. So in the dedicatory verses of the MMK, Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna says this, I prostrate to the perfect Buddha, the best of teachers, who taught that whatever is dependently arisen, is unceasing, unborn, and annihilated, not permanent, not coming, not going, without distinction, without identity, and free from conceptual construction. In other words, you cannot apply concepts to it. It's ineffable. Um, and then he says later, uh, I prostrate, I prostrate to Gautama, who, through compassion, taught the true doctrine which relates to the relinquishing of all views. This is, these are not views about conventional reality. You can say a lot about that. It's views about ultimate reality. So, Nagarjuna is endorsing the thought that some things are ineffable. And in fact, in this, he's just being faithful to a number of sutras, not the earlier sutras, but some of the Pranaparamta sutras, which appeared around the turn of the common era. So, um, this is uh, a line from the, the, the Ashta, one of the Pranaparamta sutras in 8,000 words, where it says this, all words for things in the world must be left behind all things produced and made must be transcended. The deathless, the supreme, incomparable gnosis is then one. That is the sense. 
in which we speak of perfect wisdom. So notice all words for things must be left behind. It's ineffable. Here's another of the Pranayaparamta Sutras, um, the, um, the Diamond Sutra. I'm having trouble with my slides. Okay. So the Diamond Sutra says, words cannot explain the real nature of the cosmos. Only common people fettered with desire make use of this arbitrary method. So these Pranayaparamta Sutras actually say that ultimate reality is ineffable. And Nagarjuna is just being faithful to that. Okay. Now, um, so much for that bit of Nagarjuna. Um, let's use Nagarjuna's thought to construct, to add the fifth value. Okay, so we've got four, true, false, both, neither of the Chattrashkoti. Now let's add another one, which is ineffable. And now we're going to get another paraconsistent logic. So we've got five values and... Sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. And I don't know why. Forgive me, I'm going to uh, kill my slides and uh, reboot them. Let's hope that's better. Okay. So those are our five values now. And here are the old four values and they work exactly the same. Here's our new value, ineffability. Okay. So those are the five values. Um, how do the truth conditions work? Well, the four old values, T, B, F, and N, work exactly as before. And the value I, well, um, how would you expect ineffability to behave? Well, if a sentence is ineffable, then so is anything you can make out of it. So if A is ineffable, so is the conjunction of A and B, the disjunction of A or B, and the negation of A. So some people call I an infectious value, because if any part has the value I, so does the whole thing. And what's the definition of validity well ineffability is not a species of truth so the definition of validity is still one of truth preservation in other words an inference is valid if whenever all the premises are t or b so is the conclusion so it's essentially the same as before so not a lot has changed we've just added this fifth value and if we do that, what system of logic do we get? Well, it doesn't really have a standard name at the moment, um, but let me just tell you a rule system for it. All the rules of first degree entailment are truth preserving, except one, namely or introduction. So if A is true, but B is ineffable, well, you know that A or B is ineffable. So the inference can take you from a T to an I, and that's not truth preserving. So you have to drop that rule and you have to replace it with a slightly different rule. You can't infer A or B from A, but you can provide it. You've got this extra premise, which I've written as B dagger. And B dagger is any formula which contains all the propositional parameters in B. In other words, all, all the simple sentences which occur in B. So that, that rules out the possibility that B, B is truth valueless. Okay. Now, uh, there may be some questions about that, but we're near the end. So let me finish off. Um, what you've seen is how in the thought of Nagarjuna, he recognizes a fifth possibility, namely ineffability. And you've also seen how you can build that into another paraconsistent logic. 
a five valued power consistent logic, which is kind of a variation on first degree entailment. Now, of course, there is much more to Nagarjuna than I've said. We're not discussing Nagarjuna in general, but just one small aspect of Nagarjuna's thought. Moreover, um, Nagarjuna is just the beginning of the Madhyamaka tradition. So there's lots more to be said, even about the Chaturishkoti in later Madhyamaka thinkers, both in India, in Tibet, in China. So there's a lot more to the story than this. However, you can do only so much in a short lecture. And we've looked at least at the beginning of the Madhyamaka story and its connection with power consistency. So let me end with one final comment and a kind of taste about what was to come after Nagarjuna. So you don't have to think very hard to see that there's a paradox of expressibility here. So Nagarjuna is telling us that you can't talk about the ineffable. But he himself talks about the ineffable. So it seems that it's both ineffable and not ineffable because he talks about it. So we have a paradox here. Um, and what to make of this paradox is a thread that runs through later Madhyamaka philosophy. Um, here, here is um, a later commentator. This is Chandrakirti, um, who's probably the most influential commentator on Nagarjuna in the Tibetan tradition. And Chandrakirti says this, the Buddhas who have an unmistakable knowledge of the nature of the two truths proclaim that all things out and inner as they are perceived by two kinds of subject, deluded consciousness on the one hand and perfectly pure wisdom on the other, possess a twin identity. <coughs> they say that the object perceived by authentic primordial wisdom is ultimate reality, whereas the object of a deluded perception is the relative truth. <coughs> now, notice that Chandrakirti is saying positive things about the ultimate. It is what is perceived by authentic primordial wisdom. Now, there's a debate in later Majamaka between what the Tibetans called the Prasangiha Majamakas and the Svartrantika Majamakas about whether you can say positive things about the ultimate or not. Um, and oddly, Chandrakirti is a Prasangika. So, um, a standard interpretation of Prasangika is that you can only say negative things. That interpretation of Chandrakirti has to be wrong just because you can see for yourself that Chandrakirti is saying positive things about the ultimate. All right. Now, th there's a lot of story to be told here. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that. Um, but I give this to you just as a taster of some of the later developments in Madhyamaka philosophy. But um, you've at least seen, oh, this is Chandrakirti, by the way. Um, you've at least seen that um, some of the important connections between uh, Madhyamaka philosophy and contemporary paraconsistent logics. As I said, um, it will be anachronistic to say that Nagarjuna or the Buddha or Chandrakirti had the conception of a modern form of logic. They obviously didn't. But you've also seen how some of the underlying conceptual apparatus of Buddhism and Madhyamaka can actually be used as the conceptual basis that underlies some power consistent logics. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions you have now. Thank you, Professor Priest, for such a lucid explanation to that complex topic. Thank you very much, sir. It was great listening to you. Uh, now, uh, we may continue our discussion. Uh, if we have more questions, you may raise them now. 
Okay, I'm going to try and I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, so I can see people. Uh, I don't know quite how to do that. Oh, maybe if I hit stop, how about that? Good. Okay, I'll, I'll bring the slides back up if necessary. Okay, but otherwise, let me see people. Yeah. Are there questions in the chat box, Ramya? Uh, no, we don't have any questions. Uh, but somebody All has right. raised his hand. Siddiq Alam Beg has raised his hand. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, please go. Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, hi, Professor. Gram Pist uh, Siddiqui Zair from Raigans University. <coughs> Hello. Uh, I think uh, you are you, you are doing very well uh, amidst of this uh, Omicron. Uh, <coughs> uh, um, I have a comment um, uh, on your entire lecture. Actually, I have a, actually a doubt. Uh, regarding mm -hmm. your thesis about uh, Nagarjuna's uh, uh, paraconsistent logic. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, my point is that uh, uh, so far I understood uh, um, Nagarjuna's Tetralima thesis. It is uh, truths about uh, the mundane world, truths about uh, uh, some truths. Um, That's conventional so reality, is, yes. Um, it, it belongs to a meta level, uh, um, and uh, the logic uh, uh, you were talking about the para consistency, para, para consistent logic, logic. It is, it is. Uh, um, you, uh, you may say, uh, or you may say that it is uh, uh, um, no, um, first order logic. Okay, so um, I doubt uh, there may be a mis level mismatch uh, between. Uh, para consistence para consistent logic of your version and uh, logic of uh, uh, philosophy that means uh, yeah that, that, that's interesting um look the distinction and between another point is that uh, another point is that uh, uh, is, is can there be any para consistent logic para consistent meta logic if uh, such meta logic is possible then you can match the uh, level uh, of uh, nagarjuna logic and para consistent logic that's my point okay good um let me take the questions in reverse order first of all there is such a thing as a para consistent meta logic Okay, um, logicians are still working out the details and arguing about how it should work, but yes, there is. Um, but paraconsistent logicians in general are not very sympathetic to the object language meta language distinction for reasons to do with the paradox of self reference, which we needn't go into at the moment unless you want to. So, the distinction between the object language and the meta language is actually a construction of early 20th century logic. Usually it's attributed to Tarski. Um, and uh, paraconsistent logicians tend not to like it. Okay, now let's come back to your first question about Nagarjuna. Um, it is the fifth value um, on a meta level, well, I, I don't know of anywhere in Madhyamaka texts, Nakajuna or, or later texts, which suggest anything like the conceptual distinction between an object language and a meta language. This may be my ignorance. If I'm wrong, please tell me. But um, attributing the object language meta language distinction to Nagarjuna strikes me as anachronistic. Okay, what I've been doing is anachronistic too because he didn't have the techniques of paraconsistent logic. But I think this is anachronistic in a, in a less satisfactory way. Um, th th there is absolutely no reason to attribute this distinction to Nagarjuna, as, as far as I can see. Thank you. Professor Dabi? Yes. Uh, I just want to know that uh, in the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, Simon Blackburn specifically mentions you, sir, Graham Priest. He mentions you when he explains the term paraconsistent logic and he says that uh, you have selected inconsistencies such as those generated by the semantic paradoxes. 
now my question is wordsworth says the child is the father of man in his very famous poetry is that you know semantic paradox or is it russell's paradox sorry i'm not sure i've grasped the question can you tell me again please yes uh, see while explaining para consistent logic in the oxford dictionary yes, Simon, no, just 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 the last bit just the last bit Yes, the last part. Just, of just, it. just the last bit. I, I know about Simon. Okay, he, he is explaining that you have explained semantic paradox and Russell's paradox. As far yes. as paraconsistent logic is concerned, according yes. to him in his Oxford Dictionary. Now yes, my, yes, that's question, true. my question is that Wordsworth, in his very famous poem, he says the child is the father of the man. Yes, I know the poem. Yes. Now, is that you know according to you, semantic paradox or the research paradox for para consistent logic? With reference to para consistent logic, there is a paradox in this statement. What kind of you know para consistent logic is that in that statement? If you can tell me. Okay. All right. So, look. The par the paradox of self reference are a wide variety of paradoxes that involve self-reference. Um, and the oldest of them is the liar paradox, which concerns a sentence, this sentence is not true. Um, and it would seem to be the case that if it's true, it's not true. And if it's not true, it's true. So it seems to be both true and not true. That's the paradox, right? Now, throughout the history of Western logic, people have tried to explain what's wrong with this paradox. And they haven't been very successful because even after two and a half thousand years, there's still no consensus on the matter. So what some people who endorse the power of consistent logic say is that there's nothing wrong with these arguments, um, that the, the liar sentence is both true and false. OK. So. Um, if you subscribe to a power consistent logic, you can hold indeed that some things are true. And I do. Now, I don't think that the liar paradox figures in Indian philosophy. I've never seen any reference to it in Indian philosophy, but I'd be really interested to know if there was. However, the family of paradox of self reference do involve some concerning. Um, ineffability. It would take a rather long time to explain these, so I won't try. But in set theory, for example, there are paradoxes of ineffability concerning the ordinals. Um, just take my word for that. So the paradox of ineffability that we ended with is not a million miles away from some of the paradox of self-reference. Um, so th th there's another connection there, which we which I could have talked about at greater length, but again, you can't, you can do only so much in a short talk. I don't, if that, does that answer your question or have I missed the point? Yeah, is, is that fine? Uh, prof yeah, Professor Ghosh. I will not get it up. Yes, Professor uh, Ghosh, Rajit Ghosh, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Priest, for your uh, nice presentation. But uh, I have some, I want some clarification uh, mm -hmm. regarding this uh, paradox of expressibility that you have mentioned. Now, right. in Madhamika, if we accept being, non being, uh, being and non being, and neither being nor non being, these four, and all these are, according to you, are simultaneously possible because uh, in the para consistent logic. Now, if that be the fact, then uh, when we start with being, how uh, Madhamika can be consistent in uh, passing on this type of logic into their ontology of Sunyata. So uh, this is again, I, I think, think uh, that uh, they probably start with the final and then they enter into the domain of conventional. How do you react to this? Well, your question is, how can they do this consistently? And the answer is they can't. <laughs> Majyamaka is essentially a paradoxical philosophy. 
Now, of course, of, course, of, of course, this is contentious, okay? And um, Majamika philosophers disagree about this, um, especially after about the 6th and 7th century, with the influence of Dignagra and Dharmakirti, the principle of non-contradiction becomes pretty orthodox in Majamika. And after the 6th and 7th century, then all means of techniques are used to try to avoid this paradox. We can talk about those if you like, you probably know them better than I do. Um, but at least until the 6th and 7th century, you don't find Majamika philosophers balking at the idea that uh, you can describe the ineffable and therefore endorsing this paradox. Thank you, Shikalaji, uh, for this uh, opportunity to make my mind a little open here. Uh, I am very thankful to uh, Professor Priest uh, for a very good and enlightening talk. Uh, but uh, you see, what I am going to say uh, is basically kind of uh, loud thinking. Uh, and it's, uh, the, the topic has been very interesting for me. Um, you know, some three or four propositions or maybe five or six also, uh, I'm not sure, uh, I would like to make. And if Professor Priest finds uh, uh, some question hidden in it, because I'm not able to uh, formulate a question, you know, though I have a question in my mind, you know. <laughs> you know, you know the, the point is this, ineffability, anilvachaniyatva of Shankaracharya, uh, perhaps uh, falls within the categories of truth values uh, which a professor has spoken just, uh, just now. Um, but if you go to Ramanujacharya, or if you go to go to go to Madhvacharya, uh, under Ikshatya Dikarana, uh, Madhvacharya clearly says there is nothing that is avachya, there is nothing that is ineffable. Nothing, absolutely. Sorry, can I can I stop? Can I stop you for a second? Because I'm missing some. Yeah, please, words. please, please. I, I I I just don't recognize the names you're using. So can you say them again slowly, please? Uh, and tell yeah, me who uh, they are. You know, uh, that after Buddha, we have very dominant uh, philosophers uh, in the Indian scene. Uh, yes, uh, yes. With the non-dualist uh, Advaitin Shankaracharya. Yes, yes. Maybe okay, got it, got it. Seventh century AD, and later we okay. have Ramanujacharya, who uh, is specialized in that um, uh, Vishishta Advaita, that is qualified monism. Okay, I've got it now. Thank you. Thank you. I've got it. I've got it. This is non dualism, qualified monism, and uh, dualism of Madhuacharya. Okay. You know, I myself have uh, tried to give, beginning with the Buddha, the Shunyatva, up to Madhvacharya, I have tried to incorporate certain mathematical uh, uh, theories involved in that. One is uh, with the Shankaracharya, the hypersurface, and then uh, with Ramanujacharya, the Pascal Triangle, what we call it is actually our Meru, uh, Meru, you know, Prasthara Meru. Uh, Ramanujacharya and then sphere theory, sphere packing or lattice theory. I have tried to incorporate these things, you know. Uh, uh, most of these things are available within the uh, Vedantic literature also. Uh, that is within sure. the Saundarya Lahari, then uh, Ramanujacharya's uh, 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 Tantra Sara, although it is basically uh, connected with worshipping and then uh, we have Samhitas in which uh, these mathematical things are uh, 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 explained. And then with Madhvachar in Tantra Sara Sangraha and uh, Suladi. I mean, that's a part, you know, these are the, uh, the, the, the sources where we can find some of the points. Though I'm not able to quote the points, you know, the exact points there. Uh, so uh, beginning with, uh, if you begin with Buddha, Shankaracharya perhaps uh, 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 inserts the ineffability value. Well and good. There is no problem. I have spoken about fuzzy logic on that. Uh, but then what happens is this. Veslo uh, Lejewski, if I remember correctly, in 94, this book, you know, there he mentions most of our logic are based on ontology. Uh, the, 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 that, is, that is, you know, that is the way of our thinking, you know. 
if you, if you do not have the ontological basis, there is no logic at all. I mean, logic, you can create certain theoretical framework which have no application. You know, the, when I made this point with the Professor Richard Swinburne, he said that, uh, he told me that, uh, look, uh, this logic is universal. Logic is universal, there is no application for that. Uh, when I spoke of dimensionalities, beginning with four dimensions to Madhu Acharya's uh, 24 dimensions, you know. Can uh, I please uh, sum up? The point is this, you know, the point, you know, the point is the logical points uh, that uh, uh, the, the ineffability, etc. must have some ontological basis. Without the ontological basis, including Buddha, uh, you know, Shankaracharya has come because he could make some points against Buddha, otherwise uh, Shankaracharya would not have been able to succeed, you know. And Nagarjuna's points also, I can say, you know, they are using certain mathematical principles. Anyway, I mean, uh, I don't think I have formulated the question, so if you find some question, you may respond on that. Okay, uh, just, just a couple of yeah. comments. Um, of course, Buddhism is only one of the Indian philosophical traditions. Um, and you're absolutely right that um, many interesting things are said about the issues in, in, uh, in Yaya philosophy and Advaita and, uh, and that some of the orthodox Hindu schools. Uh, and at least in some of them, uh, th th they appear to endorse the notion of ineffability as well. Um, my understanding of Advaita is, is precisely thus. Um, and indeed, that it goes back to some of the um, parts of the the, the the Vedic literature, such as the Rig Veda, which seem to suggest that. So um, I don't deny that um, ineffability <coughs> appears in other Indian traditions as well. Um, second point is that the view that you attribute to Richard Swinburne is a view that was common in logic maybe 50 years ago. Um, I think it's pretty much gone now because uh, if you look at logic and its history, um, every logic has a metaphysical underpinning uh, and you, you cannot divorce logic from metaphysics. So, you know, I agree entirely with your point. Yeah. Dilip ji, uh, Dilip, uh, Professor Dilip, you, no Santosh, no, you had your chance. Uh, one, one, please, uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, very interesting presentation. And he said that the rest of the talk is in FM. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> yes, yes, this uh, an ineffability constitutes mm -hmm. the fifth value, according to Professor Price, is it? Correct. And also, one of the very interesting questions by young scholar that uh, how can you relate this? He was introducing the linguistic dimensions, meta language, object language. The reply by Professor Peace to us there is no such division in Mula Madhamaka Karika. Am I right? Correct. Yes. So, my, uh, so you see, uh, in fact, and and uh, we have this ontology free logic. Is it possible for you? Ontology I don't think so. As, I, as I've just said, I think every logic has an underlying metaphysics. Right. Although, correct. Correct. You know, so, so logicians deny that. In the to night. my mind, I don't know much about this classical development of logic to para consistent logic. Uh, this is my 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 only some portions of modal logic and some uh, this is the pm systems uh, by I, I studied long 40 years back with 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 logician onion shukla so far as i remember these things you see uh many nagarjuna to my mind there are seven dialectical works of nagarjuna which we called vipratipatti mulaka shastra seven and if you read one apart from the other, it will be more confusing. Especially if you read only Mula Madhamaka Karika without reading the Sobriti, which is called Akuta Bhaya Tika, and other developments, 
you will be in more trouble. That is why he has written two more small treaties. One is called Sunyata Saptati. Long back, ten years back, I I I did some work on this, and other is Bigraha Bebartani. These are not two independent works. Only the question raised against this philosophical understanding of the world was there, and there are replies also. And the very first verse of Sunyata Saptati, you will get that all these are said about Buddha. Is from the point of view of Sangbriti Satta, not Tattata. And it and this actually amounts to the present day division of language in logic as matter language. Otherwise, you will have this contradiction. Second point is this: even this Chatushkuti is not an invention of Nagarjuna. There is another misunderstanding among people. It has its origin in the pre-Buddhist philosophy. If you go through B. M. Borua, Beni Madhav Borua, pre-Buddhist Indian philosophy, Takshashila University was a famous university. The Greeks were used to come here for learning, and there is Sanjay's student. His name was Supriya, and Supriya's student was Piro, Greek philosopher Piro, and. There we see this Amara Bhikshepo Bado. It has been developed, used by Nagarjuna and developed by Chandrakirti and others in order to defend this. The motto Nagarjuna study one must begin with Vaidala Sutra, where he clearly stated his Purvapakshas as Nayaikas. Nayaikas has these presuppositions called Drishti Vahadinas, the dogmatic presuppositions. The world is divided into exclusively divided into two halves. One is bhavo, another is obhavo. If bhavo is true by relational logic, they can say it is not the case that bhavo is false. Just like the truth functional logic of the West, as you mentioned there. But Ragarjuna does not subscribe to such logic because, as rightly pointed out by Professor Srikala Nair in the beginning. That Nagarjuna ontological presupposition she hinted is different. That is to under how do we understand the world around us? Fuzzy world. The area of unknowing is more than the area of knowing. That is why there are some big world. The bigness is not always bad. The Buddhists do not say the bigness is more important for our understanding of the world. Another misunderstanding comes when he, he mentioned the distinction between truth, you know, conventional truth and ultimate truth. These are not two independent absolute categories. And there is no distinction, as Nagarjuna said himself in the Mulamadamar Karika, even that Sangsharat Nirvanasya Nasti Kinchit Visheshanam. Nirvanasya Sansarat Nasti Kinchit I know the quote. It's a very, very technical, technically constructed verse. So, where like the difference? That it is Paramartho, they are not Paramartiko. The Vedantist view is Paramartiko. Here it is Paramartho. It is within the periphery of epistemology, the knowledge situation. Paramartho means Paramam Ortam. The highest meaning, how far we can go when we know that there is a limitation of our understanding of the world, which is called Sangbriti Sattva. This realization itself makes you egoless, and then only you can achieve the so called ineffability. So, ineffability is not an additional value, only with these four values and their negations. I think Nagarjunian philosopher can very well they do what they wanted to do. There is no need of this fourth, fifth uh, value as value of affability. Why not? Because we shall have to go back to Bigraha Vevartani, verse 29. Yadi kachan pratigga saname bhavad dosam nasticha mama pratigga. Naivasti to me, those 
had had I been a thesis to put forward, you can blame me that I have some these defects since I don't have. So this <laughs> ineffability thesis also like no thesis argument does not stand. It is not an assertive statement. So unless you analyze the language in different levels of layers of its meaning, how can you meet this contradiction? The denial of the law, so-called law of excluded medial, to Nagarjuna you know, does not lead to the law of contradiction. Therefore, he has, I, to my mind, I do not know much about this Western logic. He, his logic is a kind of consistency phobia free logic because he is explaining the real world. Everything is conditionally arisen and interdependent everything is not only conditionally arises but it is interdependent existence you know so the very 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 meaning of the word pratita samutpada has a different kinds of meaning and eh? one is the hinojanist other is the mahajanist so nagarjuna has a different understanding and that is why the understand the real as real so it's a very so I'm only just explaining the textual positions. Again, therefore, we need not need this fifth value. Number one. Number two, unless you explain the language in the light of Sunnata Saptoti's first bars, again there will be contradiction. That is why the concept of negation, understanding the concept of negation is very important to them. In the Yaika, it is parjudhasa pratisheda, which amounts to relational negation. Suppose for non-technical language, if I use P, P is a categorical statement, it's true. And negation P is the negation of P. Then you can get the value false. But Nagarjuna, P is true in certain condition K, and not P is true in certain different condition uh, yes, therefore, these two are not contradictory, and there is no contradictions. Very, I, I have the textual support here. You see, it is called. Uh, Mr. Mahanta, we, we need to wind up, avoid the textual quotes. Just put up your points. It just Mula uh, Madhamake uh, Karika, chapter 18, verse number 8. You see, Atma Pariksha, Chandra Kirti. When he wrote the commentary referred to Aryadeva's Chatushtaka, Aryadeva's Chatushtaka, it is said, the Balo Jano Gyano Pekshaya and Aryo Jano Gyano Pekshaya. So, this is a, a set of person is different from when he is speaking about uh, this Paramartha and others. So always there is the division, the layers of understanding of language only, I think. And therefore, Mike, <laughs> it's very interesting. Papa, very difficult to agree when you interpret with the fifth value. Anyway, thank you so much. I feel much educated. If you have any comment, uh, well, Professor, you, please, uh, Professor, please, before you uh, answer to Professor Mahante, I'll also just add to what uh, he has to say. Together, you can answer. I also subscribe. Uh, of course, I disagree with Professor Mahanta when he has said that uh, the Agajana was not uh, uh, defeating the law of excluded middle. I don't think so. But uh, uh, two points that you have said, I totally agree with you. That is, the ineffability need not be a fifth value. That is not what Nagarjuna intended. As I understand, ineffability, I completely agree with Professor Mahanti. I wanted to take the last chance since uh, I am uh, uh, conducting the um, uh, discussion. I thought I'll take the last chance. So ineffability need not be the fifth value. That is, I don't think that is the intention of uh, uh, Nagarjuna, neither Nagarjuna nor Gautama Buddha. Uh, and uh, something else I wanted. I forgot about uh, the law. Uh, uh, the um, the two types of negation, which again uh, Professor Mahanta was uh, trying to, unless we bring in the two type of two types of negation, or in other words, unless you connect the logic with the epistemology, uh, then I don't think we'll not understand Nagarjuna 
very well because his logic is not standing in the mid air it is i mean actually he is interested in epistemology his primary goal is to address epistemology and again you know uh, inside that you have the ontology his core con concern is ontology or not even ontology in fact it is religion as i have said initially so it is religion you have the inner core as religion outer core ontology and still outer core you have epistemology and the outermost layer is logic that is how i understand Look, th thank you for your thoughts and your comments. Uh, there are so many issues that have been raised in the last 10 minutes. I'm sure I've forgotten many of them. Um, but it seems to me that so many different points are being <coughs> to me, so many different points are being run together. Um, one needs to take a lot of these points separately, otherwise one risks a great deal of confusion. Some of the things that have been said I agree with, some of the things I disagree with. <coughs> Now, um, let's just focus on what I think to be the central point of disagreement, which is about the fifth value of ineffability. Um, <coughs> of course, this is a textual question. I agree with that. Um, and it should be said straight away that um, there are many debates about how you interpret Nagarjuna, both amongst Indian scholars, Tibetan scholars, and modern Western scholars. So this is a matter of contention. Um, I've given you one interpretation of the text. I'm well aware there are others, but the uh, interpretation I've given strikes me as very plausible. And I've given you some reasons. I mean, he says explicitly that none of the four cotis applies. So there must be something else going on, right? Okay, what is it? Well, I've told you what I think it is and told you why I think that is. Um, I, I'm not alone in this. I mean, there are many Majyamaka commentators, such as in Tibet, um, Tsongkhapa and Garompa, who interpret it this way. Um, so this is not an unusual interpretation, but I agree it's contentious. Uh, look, there, there, there are so many other points which we could talk about, but, you know, that... It would take us the rest of the night to do this. So maybe I'll just leave it at that and just say, um, I, I recognize your interpretation, but I don't find it the most plausible interpretation of Nagarjuna. I have last question. Uh, no, oh, uh, over to the competitor. Hello? Um, over to the competitor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful discussion. Now, uh, may I invite uh, Professor S. Sheba, Assistant Director, International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Ramya. Uh, good evening to one and all. Respected President of this session, uh, Honorable Former Vice Chancellor Sir Dilip Kumar Mohandiji, uh, Distinguished Scholar and today's speaker, Professor Graham Priest, Distinguished M. School Pro Senior Professors, my dear students, a warm good evening to one and all. The International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies today feels so proud to have blessed with the deliberations of the two eminent scholars and is uh, supported by um, the discussions initiated by senior professors like uh, Professor Jayam Dev, Professor Renjit Ghosh, Professor Venekumar Rao, and other scholars on Nagarjuna. Now it is the time for official vote of thanks. It is my pleasure and privilege to express our sincere gratitude to Honorable Pro Former Vice Chancellor Sir, Professor Dili Kumar Mohandiji, for his uh, inciting presidential address and for chairing this wonderful session on Nagarjuna. And thank you very much, sir, for chairing this session. On behalf of International School for Sri Shankaracharya Studies, uh, I express our sincere words of gratitude to our today's speaker, the eminent scholar, Professor Graham Fritz, for brilliantly exposition for the brilliant exposition of the topic para consistent logic and mathematics. Thank you very much, sir, for the in informative speech. Uh, I am also grateful to our um, 
director, our enthusiastic and vibrant director, Professor Shrikala Nair, the master brain behind all these academic activities for welcoming this call, the scholars. Thank you, ma'am. Now I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to all the eminent personalities, distinguished scholars, and my dear students for joining with us in this academic event. Thank you all. Once again, I thank one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohandeji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste. Wonderful. Great discussion. Lovely. Actually, this is, a, this is one, one session we had most discussion. I was wondering, since it is uh, logic, yes. people might not uh, <laughs> come up with discussion. But then, actually, there were several questions, which I could not permit them, because uh, we were running out of time. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so yeah. much, Professor Priest. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. We are grateful. Good night, Paul. Good night, Thank Paul. you very much for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. You. Good night. Good night. Good night.